Okay, so the purpose of this training video is to discuss some updates to the sexual dependency inventory, including switching to the use of percentile scores, and as well as a couple of other interpretive issues that we'll go over. So the main objectives for this training are one, to understand um, the concept of norms and the rationale for normative samples for those of you who may not be familiar. Uh, two is to understand um, what percentile scores are, so the definition of percentile scores. And three, we'll discuss um, the similarities and differences between percentile scores and t-scores, um, primarily because unless you're brand new to the SDI, you, you know that we've used um, T-scores on the measure previously. So I think it'll help for you to understand the differences between the two. And then fourth objective is to um, not only understand percentile scores, but how to interpret um, the meaning of percentile scores when you're using the SDI. And then finally, um, we'll discuss a little bit about um, how endorsement rates of the items on the SDI can affect scale scores um, and, and how that's important to take into account when you're interpreting an SDI. So understanding normative samples. We'll start, I think it's important as we get into discussing um, T-scores and percentiles and the differences between them, it's important to make sure we're all on the same page about understanding what a normative sample is. So that's where I wanted to start today. And I'll start with a, a definition of a normative sample from Nunley and Bernstein's um, psychometrics text. And they define a normative sample as any statistical data that provide a frame of reference to interpret an individual's scores relative to scores of others, since an absolute number correct has little meaning in isolation. Okay, now one, one caveat to this is when they say number correct, they're using the term number correct in this context because um, they were discussing academic achievement tests, so um, tests that have actual right or wrong responses. But the definition really applies more generally to any psychometric test, such as the SDI. And you can think of instead of instead of an absolute number correct has little meaning in isolation. You can think of it as since an absolute um, number of items endorsed has little meaning in isolation. Um, so in our context, you can pretty just substitute raw score for absolute number correct. That's probably the simplest way to think about it. So a normative sample is, is basically data from um, lots of people who have taken the test from a particular population um, that gives so that we can have some idea of what the raw score actually means relative to a large number of people. So a less technical definition of a normative sample is simply test scores from a representative sample of the population of interests in order to determine what is typical or normal for that population. Um, so when I say a representative sample of the population of interests, we want to make sure a normative sample is representative. Um, you know, in terms of demographics or age groups or whatnot that we're interested in generalizing to when we give the test. And in population of interest, for a lot, some tests, that population of interest is what we just consider sometimes called the normal population, just general population. Sometimes the population of interest may be a clinical sample. Um, in which case we'd be comparing scores on the test, scores that our clients get on the test, to um, the typical representative um, clinical patient. So we'll get a little bit more into to that in a bit in terms of taking into, into account 
what the population of the normative sample is. Okay, so next step is just to address, so why do we really need norms to interpret psychological test scores? Um, and this is an important concept to make sure we're on the same page with as well. Um, so I'm going to spend a, just a few minutes discussing this issue, and it, and it kind of gets at what the definition of norms was talking about um, when Nunley and Bernstein said, you know, essentially a raw score doesn't really have much meaning um, without understanding uh, how the average person responds to the test. So. Um, that brings us to the concept of hypo hypothetical constructs. So psychological tests measure hypothetical constructs, which primarily means they can't be directly measured. Um, and, and so the easiest way to think about that is contrast that with, with, with other types of measurements which are not hypothetical. So for instance, weight is not hypothetical. Length is not hypothetical. Those can be directly measured, whereas something like depression, we can't directly measure, we can't directly observe how much depression somebody has somewhere in their mind or their brain, um, but we can measure that person's behaviors and thoughts and emotional responses um, that are indicators of depression. So because of the fact that they're hypothetical, it brings us to the fact that psychological test scores, any test score on any psychological test, the metric of the score is actually arbitrary. And what do I mean by metric? Well, think about something like weight. The, the metric of weight is pounds, and that, that's not arbitrary. We know actually what a pound is. Um, the metric of length, um, if you live in the United States, at least, is, is uh, for instance, inches or feet. That's, that's not arbitrary. But what is the metric for like a score on a Beck depression inventory or a score on a subscale of the SDI? We don't know what the metric actually is. And because of that, how a test scores map on to the actual range of this hypothetical construct is, is really unknown. And to illustrate what I mean by that, con consider this question. If somebody takes the Beck Depression Inventory and they max it out, they, they score the maximum score possible, does that necessarily mean that the person has the most severe depression possible? And the answer to that is not necessarily. Although people that haven't really considered this issue of arbitrary metrics might ne not necessarily respond that way. Might, they might tend to think of it as, okay, you maxed out on the Beck depression inventory, so that's as, you have as much depression as humanly possible. And similarly, consider this other hypothetical question. Um, does a minimum score on the Beck Depression Inventory, so they, they circle, I believe, the lowest score on the items on the BDI are zero, so they, let's say they score a zero on the BDI, does that necessarily mean they have the lowest severity of depression possible? Or does that mean, you know, does that mean they have complete absence of depression? And again, the answer is not necessarily, um, because we don't really know what, say, 20 on the BDI corresponds to on the actual continuum of the hypothetical construct of depression. Let me show you a slide on the next page, and this comes from a really interesting article by Blanton and Jacquard in 2006 um, on this concept of the fact that we have arbitrary metrics and psychological tests. So this is um, this is a uh, 
screenshot of the of this an actual figure from Bland and Jacquard, page 29, um, where they're explaining this example. So trying to explain what I was getting at on the previous slide. So I'm just going to walk through a few of the the main points here, and this is completely just um, hypothetical, made up example that they gave to illustrate this concept of not really knowing what a observed score on a test um, reflects in and of itself on the underlying continuum. So up here, let's the, the example they used was the construct of marital satisfaction. Um, so this up here on the top line, this represents the actual underlying dimension of marital satisfaction to where this end here is like complete dissatisfaction and this end here reflects complete satisfaction. Um, and so we have here in the middle a neutral point, basically like uh, not really satisfied, not really unsatisfied. So let's just say, for example, we have person A and person B, presumably perhaps a couple that's come in for couples counseling. Um, and so the arrow is pointing to where person A is on the, the actual continuum of marital satisfaction. So person A is slightly dissatisfied with their marital relationship and person B is slightly satisfied with their marital relationship. Okay, now let's say we have scale X that measures marital satisfaction. And then we also have another scale, um, perhaps by another researcher that's published, um, scale Z that also measures marital satisfaction. And let's say both of these scales, scale X and scale Z, both have the same range of possible scores. Let's say they, they each have six items and you respond true or false. So you can score anywhere between zero and six. Um, so let's say person A, who's slightly dissatisfied with their relationship, takes this scale X um, and she scores a zero. She said false to all of them. And then person B, who's slightly satisfied, um, takes the test and scores a three. They're right about in the mid-range. Um, yeah, they're exactly in the middle. So they're they're pretty much on the on scale X. They're coming out as what you might think of as kind of neutral. They're um, right directly in the middle. Now contrast that to where they score on scale Z. So let's say they both take a second measure, this the scale Z. Now this time, person A, who's slightly dissatisfied, um, scores a two instead of a zero, and person B scores a four instead of a three. Now there's a lot of things you can say about this, but one interesting thing I'll point out is um, what this is reflecting, first of all, is scale X maps on to the con actual continuum of marital satisfaction differently than scale Z. So scale X maps on to this portion of marital satisfaction and scale Z, I can find my pointer here, scale Z maps on to a much larger range. I didn't draw that very well, but I think you get the picture. Um, another thing to notice is their levels of satisfaction look more similar to each other on scale X, I mean, in the, on scale Z than scale X. Um, they're three points apart on scale X, and they're only two points apart on scale Z. Um, and, and getting back to the question of if you score as low as possible, does that mean they have the lowest possible level of the construct? This makes it clear, let me go back to my laser pointer, that person A, who in reality is slightly dissatisfied with their relationship, 
um, she scored as low as possible on scale X. But obviously, we can see from this that she is nowhere near the lowest possible level of satisfaction. And on the other hand, you can see if you score a maximum on this, a score of six, that also doesn't mean that you're on the highest possible level of satisfaction. Because somebody who is here, 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 all will score a six on this measure. So I'm not going to belabor this too much longer. I could, um, if you're a student in my psychometrics class, you would get a little bit longer detail on this. But hopefully this helps illustrate that the concept of the fact that the, the unit of measurement is arbitrary. We don't necessarily know how it maps on to the underlying construct with just knowing the raw score by itself. Um, and of course, we don't know, you know, this is hypothetical, so we can see here where scale X and scale Z are mapping on, but we don't know that in reality. Okay, so that brings us back to with the discussion of why do we need norms to interpret the test scores. Um, and that's primarily because of the fact that the metric is arbitrary. We don't need norms for metrics that aren't arbitrary. It wouldn't make any sense. So contrast measurements with non-arbitrary metrics. For example, speed. We know what the meaning of 10 miles per hour is. Um, and we know that zero miles per hour is the complete absence of speed or complete absence of movement. The object is at rest. Um, length. If I tell you a table is five feet long, you may not be able to show me exactly how long that is, but you have an understanding of what that means. And you, you have an understanding of the difference between something, say, a person who's six foot tall versus a person who's four feet tall. And that's because the metric of feet in this case is not arbitrary. And to get into even a little bit more technical detail of the implications of that, we, we also know um, that four feet is exactly twice as long as two feet. And we know that the difference in length between something that's two feet long and four feet long is exactly the same difference in length as that of something that's eight feet versus ten feet. And why am I pointing this out? And the reason I'm pointing that out is we don't necessarily know that with test scores. The difference between a score of a 10 and a 15 on the on a say the Beck depression inventory might not be this exact same difference in level of depression as the difference between score of a 20 and a 25 because of the fact that the metric's arbitrary. Okay, so I think you've probably heard enough about my soapbox on arbitrary metrics. And I don't say that to get people depressed about psychological tests um, because there are solutions to the fact that the metric's not arbitrary. and that's where we, norms actually come in. So how do norms actually help with the situation? They don't completely eliminate the arbitrary of the metric, the arbitrariness of the metric. In other words, they don't magically make the metric non-arbitrary, but they do help provide a context from which to interpret a, a score, which lends some meaning to the score that's not achieved by just knowing the raw score. So they do reduce the arbitrariness of the score and they provide the score with some additional meaning to help us understand, okay, what does a, a score of a raw score of a 30 mean compared to, you know, a raw score of a 50? 
Um, if we don't have norms, we don't necessarily know, like, okay, what does that mean? Is that a high score or a low score? Is it typical? Is it abnormal or what? So that's where norms come in. So that brings um, us to a discussion about the concept of norm reference scores. And specifically, I'll talk about percentiles and T-scores. Because um, the SDI, like a lot of um, psychological tests, have used T-scores to express um, scale scores on the SDI. And now we're using percentiles, which a lot of psychological tests use as well. So I'll start with percentile scores. Um, and and now before I give you the definition of percentile score, I want to say I call these norm reference scores is because essentially they're a transformation of the raw score into a score that takes into account how people typically respond to the test based on the norm sample. Okay, what is a percentile score? Definition of a percentile score, and this is um, from Nunnally and Bernstein as well. A percentile indicates the percentage of persons in the normative sample at or below a particular score. So it's 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 fairly simple, and there is there are a lot of advantages to using a percentile score. Um, because it's it's really intu I think in, intuitively easier to understand um, compared to a T score, and I mean if if you're somebody who has done you know taken a lot of psychometrics courses and done test development, then a T score is sort of um, fairly simple. But um, if you haven't done a lot of that, a percentile is much more intuitive, I think. And it's definitely much more intuitive for a client to understand. If you're sitting down and explaining a client's results on the SDI, um, the average person is going to understand a percentile much more easily. So basically, it reflects um, the percentage of persons in the normative sample that scored that score or less. So in that respect, they can range from 0 to 100. And we, we typically talk about the scores, we'd say like if they scored um, a 10, we'd say you scored in the 10th percentile. Um, if you've had kids that have, um, that have taken like the SAT, um, those are commonly expressed as um, uh, percentiles. So you may have had exposure to this already. So just a couple of examples. Um, so for example, if, if in the normative sample, um, if 75% of the people in the normative sample obtained a raw score of 35 or less, then a client who obtains a raw score of 35 will be at the 75th percentile. Okay. If, if only 10% of the normative sample obtains a raw score of, let's say, 20 or less, then, if a, then a client who obtains a raw score of 20 will be at the 10th percentile. So that's it's a fairly straightforward way of understanding um, what the score means relative to the normative sample. So if, if your client scores the 60th percentile, on a particular SDI scale, then you know that they scored high at or higher than 60% of the normative sample. So let's um, compare and contrast percentiles with T-scores. Okay, so to talk about T-scores, need to make sure Everybody's on the same page with what a z-score is because a z-score is essentially part of the computation of a t-score. Um, so if you're not familiar with a z-score, it's, it's essentially the most basic norm reference standard score. 
and essentially to compute a, a z-score if you have a normative sample to where you know the mean and the standard deviation of the raw scale score and the normative sample. To compute a z-score, you simply subtract the mean from the person's score and divide it by the standard deviation. So formula here for z-score is um, x is the raw score, mu is the mean in the normative sample, and SD is the standard deviation in the normative sample. So you simply take the person's raw score, subtract the mean of the normative sample, and then divide that result by the standard deviation in the normative sample. Um, so essentially, uh, the, the mean z-score is zero, so the z-score of zero, is, if somebody receives a z-score of zero, you know that they scored at the mean. Essentially, what the z-score does is, is it translates the raw score into a metric of standard deviation units of the normative sample. So a z-score of one means somebody scored one standard deviation above the normative sample. Okay, but we're getting to the t-score. So what is a t-score? It's a different type of norm reference standard score. Basically, um, to compute a t-score, you just multiply the z-score by 10 and then add 50. So essentially, t equals z times 10 plus 50. Um, so again, the t-score is standardized, meaning you can compare performance across multiple scales and even multiple tests um, when you have the scales and test scores expressed as t-scores. For a t-score, um, the mean is going to be 50 and the standard deviation is going to be 10. So as, as you probably already know, if you've been using the SDI already, um, if a client scores of 50, T of 50 on a scale score, that means they're at, they scored at the mean for the normative sample. If they scored a 60, they scored one standard deviation above the mean in the normative sample. So that's basically what a T score is. Okay, so as well, I already actually already said most of this on the previous slide in terms of interpretation. Um, since the t-score has a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10, um, you know when, when a client scores, say, a 50, a t-score of a 50, it means they scored equal to the mean score for the normative sample. A t-score of 60 means a client scored one standard deviation above the mean for the normative sample. You can go in the other direction too. So t-score of 40 means they scored one standard deviation below the mean for the normative sample and so on. So just FYI, for most of the clinical tests that use t-scores, they typically use a cutoff t-score of 65 or higher as indicative of an elevation on the score or clinically significant. The terminology varies somewhat, but essentially many of them use a t-score of 65 as indicating um, a significantly high score. And so that specifically, a t-score of 65 corresponds to their score being one, one and a half standard deviations above the normative sample. Okay, so again, just to kind of highlight here, I'm going to talk about just a couple uh, comparisons and contrasts between percentiles and t-scores. So in terms of comparisons, um, both percentiles and t-scores are norm reference standard scores, and therefore both t-scores and percentiles um, both provide meaning to a score by reflecting the degree to which a client's raw score is higher or lower than the mean for a large normative sample.
And also, the mean for a t-score is the same as the mean of a percentile. So um, a t-score of 50, uh, the, the mean t-score is 50, and the mean for a percentile would be 50th percentile. Now, where they contrast is how the, the sort of the metric with which they provide meaning to the score. So percentiles range from 0 to 100. Whereas t-scores, um, theoretically t-scores can range from negative infinity to positive infinity, although in um, reality most of them fall between 20 and 80. So they're on a little bit different scale than a percentile, even though they both um, are reflecting the meaningfulness of a score in terms of how much higher or lower a client's score is compared to the normative sample. So just to kind of make this a little bit even more concrete, um, I have here the, a standard normal distribution and on the figure we have tick marks um, labeled with percentile scores corresponding to each um, position within the normative um, standard normal distribution as well as Z scores and T scores. So you can see kind of how they differ. Um, so you'll see here if we look at the bottom one, I'll focus primarily on T scores and percentiles. You can see typical T scores range from 20 to 80. Um, and you can see here percentiles ranging typically from 1 to 99. Now they can go as low as 0 and as high as 100, but that's really atypical because it gets harder and harder to score a higher percentile as you get way out here in the extreme. One thing you will notice that's slightly different with percentiles is the, the spacing between percentile scores are slightly different at different ends of the continuum. It's not a large difference, but you do see here right around the mean 50th percentile between about the 30th to 70th percentile, um, the, the units are slightly closer together, um, closer to the mean, and as we get further out from the mean, the units are spread a lot. The, the units are much larger. So in other words, like look at the distance here between 50 to 60 percentile versus the difference between just 95 to 99. And that's just the nature of percentiles, because as we get out here towards the extreme end of the distribution, it takes um, a lot more extremity of the score to bump that percentile up. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about um, briefly some interpretive guidelines for um, the new percentile scores on the SDI. And as a part of this discussion, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how more frequently versus less frequently endorsed items on a scale can make a difference on, on how we um, interpret the scores. So one, one important interpretive issue that I want to emphasize here on is um, knowing that the normative sample for the SDI is a clinical sample. So when we're, when we're thinking about what elevations on the SDI scales mean clinically, it's important that you know what the norm group actually is. In other words, for, for some measures, the norm group might be a normal population. Well, for the SDI, as, as you're probably aware, it's a clinical sample. It is a large clinical sample of people who are seeking treatment um, for compulsive sexual behavior or sex addiction. So that's important because when we look at 
um, the percentile scores and think about how much higher or lower your client scores in reference to the normative sample, we have to remember it's in reference to the average um, sex addict who is in treatment. So for 50th percentile is, is average percentile, but it's important to keep in mind, if, for instance, if they score 50th percentile, that's average for a sex addict in, in treatment, not average for the average person. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is uh, the new SDI scale elevation labels. So there are new labels that you'll see now on the score reports for the SDI. We used to have um, above average, at risk, and severe risk. And so now we have, well, first of all, it's important to note within the quote unquote normal range, there's no label provided. Um, and what used to be labeled above average, the new label is elevated. What used to be labeled at risk, the new label is significantly elevated. And then instead of severe risk, we have acutely elevated. So we went from the old labels, above average, at risk, severe risk, the new labels are elevated, significantly elevated, and acutely elevated. And the rationale for that is, well, for one thing, the old terminology could be confusing. And I think most importantly, the new terminology just more accurately captures the meaning of those different ranges of score elevations. So let's talk about interpretive, interpreting within those different um, ranges using the perspective of percentiles now. So the label of elevated when the scores uh, are between 50th and 83rd percentile, that gets the label of elevated. So what does that specifically mean? So essentially in the elevated range, we it means the, the client has an average to high average endorsement for a treatment seeking sex addict of the items within that scale. So again, like I mentioned before, it's important to think about this in terms of the normative sample. Um, so elevated between 50 and 80, 83rd percentile, it also it corresponds to a score ranging anywhere from the mean for a sex addict to just under one standard deviation of the mean for the norm group. So that should give you a pretty good sort of anchor for interpreting those, that, that range there. The 83rd percentile corresponds um, to just slightly under one standard, standard deviation above the mean for the norm group. Okay, so let's move on to significantly elevated. So if, if um, the score ranges from the 84th percentile to the 97th percentile, that's going to get the label significantly elevated. So this means the person scored above from, from above average to a very high level of endorsement of those items for a treatment seeking sex addict. Another way to think about it is it corresponds to a score ranging from one standard deviation above the mean to just under two standard deviations above the mean. Moving on to acutely elevated, if a client scores in the 98th percentile or higher, that it corresponds to the score range that gets the label acutely elevated. So acutely elevated means they have extremely high level of endorsement, even for a treat, treatment seeking sex addict. Thinking about it in terms of how much higher they are scoring than the, the treatment seeking sex addicts in the normative sample, acutely elevated corresponds to a score that is at least two standard deviations or more above the mean 
Okay, so next I want to talk about um, something else that's important to take in consideration when interpreting scores, and that's the effects that item endorsement rates can have on scores, and specifically the effect that has on how easy or how hard it is to elevate a score. So let me start by giving a definition of item endorsement rate. Item endorsement rate is simply the proportion of people in the normative sample that endorse an item. So for example, on the SDI, frequency items are rated on a scale um, of 0 to 5, where 0 is never, 5 corresponds to very often. If an item is endorsed, that simply means the person rates the item with something greater than zero. So let's say, for example, let's take an item on the SDI that has a high endorsement, and that is the item viewing pornography. And that makes, makes sense that a large proportion of the people in the normative sample give this item a rating greater than zero because of the fact that it's a treatment-seeking um, sex addict population. So essentially, with viewing pornography on SDI, there's a very high proportion of the normative sample that rates this item something greater than zero. In contrast, let's Let's take a low endorsement example. So the low endorsement example would be viewing child pornography. Very few people, even in the normative sample of treatment-seeking sex addicts, rate this item as greater than zero. That's because it's essentially a, a rare behavior, even in sex addicts. Um, so, a very low proportion of the normative sample rates this item as greater than zero. So hopefully that gives you, gives you a concrete idea of what I mean by item endorsement rates. Now that, that you have an idea of what, what item endorsement rate is, essentially how common um, or uncommon it is for people to endorse certain types of item content, let's talk about how that affects um, scale scores. So let's talk about the effect of a scale that's comprised of a lot of low endorsement items. So, you know, we, we could take an ex example of this would be the exploitive sex children behavior scale. Um, most of the I say all of the items on this scale are very low endorsement rate. Very few people in the normative sample rate items in the scale greater than zero frequency. So because of the fact that all of the scale, all of the items in this scale um, have low endorsement rates, it means the means in the normative sample for this scale will be quite low. Because of the fact that very few people in the normative sample endorse any of these items and the mean is extremely low with a very small standard deviation. What that means is even just mild endorsement of even a few items can lead to a significant elevation on that scale. Another way to think about that is it's very, I'm going to say quote unquote easy to elevate and get a high percentile score on the exploitive sex children behavior scale. In other words, it only takes very mild endorsement of a couple of items on there. You're gonna, it's going to translate into um, a high percentile score. So that's what I mean by the, the effects of item endorsement rates on the scores. So let's, let's take another example of, of scale that's comprised of a lot of high endorsement items where a significantly high proportion of the normative sample um, rate the items greater than zero. What that translates into is the, the scale means from the normative sample will be quite high. And thus, even relatively high endorsement of a lot of the items on that scale might not lead to a significantly elevate 
elevated score on that scale. An example of such a scale would be the pornography use behavior scale. So if you think about it sort of in, in more practical terms, think about the pornography use scale. Uh, the, the vast majority, um, or at least a very high percentage of treatment-seeking sex addicts um, endorse items related to using pornography. Therefore, the mean of the pornography use behavior scale in the normative sample is really high. And so you really, to, to, to score in the range that's significantly elevated above the typical sex addict, you really have to highly endorse lots of items on that scale. Um, and just and so even if somebody's endorsing a lot of those items, they may not have an extremely high elevation. So hopefully that helps you understand um, the impact of, of, of scales that have relatively high endorsement rates versus low endorsement rates. In the next few slides, I'm going to highlight which specific SDI scales um, you should particularly take that into consideration for. So that brings us to which specific scales on the SDI are affected. Okay, so let's talk about endorsement rates on SDI scales. So um, which scales should we be aware of either relatively high or relatively low endorsement rates when interpreting the scores? Um, to address this, we can take a look at the means of the scales in the normative sample. So in other words, which scales have means that are relatively high, i.e. lots of items are strongly endorsed in the normative sample, and which ones have means that are relatively low, i.e. very few items are endorsed in the normative sample. Um, so we wanted to provide this information to you in a way that you could um, easily see um, which specific scales you need to keep this in mind for um, when you're interpreting SDIs for your clients. And the way we did this is um, we took the normative sample mean score and divided it by the maximum possible score. And the reason we did that is because the maximum possible score varies due to the fact that there's varying numbers of items comprising the scales. So we divided the the normative sample mean for each scale by the maximum possible score for that scale and multiplied by 100. And I'm going to show you the results here in a minute on the next slide. I've, I've um, put this into a chart. But what that computation does is it results in um, a value that expresses the scale means as a percentage of the maximum score. That way we have a kind of a common metric for comparison across all the scales for the level of endorsement. Um, so in other words, if this, this is higher, so higher percentage of maximum score means there's relatively high endorsement um, because the average is getting closer to the maximum possible score. And when that percentage is really low, it means the average in the normative sample um, is is quite is is quite close to the lowest possible score. So let me um, show you the charts on the next two pages, and I'll show you the plots of these percentage of maximum scores um, in the normative sample for the behavior scales first, and then the preoccupation scales next. Okay, so here are the normative sample behavior scale means expressed as percentage of maximum raw score using the computation I mentioned on the previous slide. So um, the on this chart, let me get the pointer here, the y-axis is percentage of maximum raw score, and then of course 
On the x-axis, we have all of the behavior scales. And you can see there's, they, they range quite a bit. Now, for our purposes to kind of operationalize this, um, what we did was we defined low endorsement scales as those that are below 10%. So in other words, scales for which the mean and the normative sample are less than 10% of the maximum possible score. And then we defined, we operationalized high endorsement rates as scales that, that were above 30%. So as you can see here, we have a, a few scales um, that seem to have relatively high endorsement rates. And we have a handful of scales that have relatively low endorsement rates. So just um, jumping out at you right here, we see um, fantasy and consequences has a quite high endorsement rate in the normative sample. Um, what that suggests is lots of people in the normative sample are endorsing lots of those items. And therefore, it's harder to yield a high percentile score on that scale. Same goes for pornography use. We used the example of pornography use earlier, hypothetically, and here you can see, in actuality, the endorsement rate for pornography use behavior scales items are quite high. Um, one other behavior scale that, that exceeds the 30% is relationship addiction. Now, on the low endorsement side, the ones that you have to take into consideration because, because of the very low endorsement rates, it only takes a few mildly endorsed items to yield a high percentile score. We have swinging in group sex, cruising behavior, pain exchange, paying for sex power, um, voyeurism and covert intrusion. That's actually like about 9.5%, even though it looks like 10% here. Exhibition, exploitive sex trust, and exploitive sex child. So those would be scales um, where it's important to keep in mind of, of quite a high score can be um, obtained with just a few items being endorsed. If you think about the content of those scales, I think it'll also help make this whole concept of um, item endorsement even more clear. Because obviously, exploited sex child, um, for instance, pain exchange, for instance, um, although you see that in some sex addicts, it's not nearly as common as something like pornography use um, or relationship addiction. Now, so those are the behavior scales. On the next slide, we have the same um, type of chart for the power scales. So here we have the same chart for the preoccupation scales. So for preoccupation scales that have relatively high endorsement, meaning it's harder to achieve very high percentile scores, we have two that exceed the 30%, and that is preoccupation with relationships and preoccupation with isolated fantasizing. For the preoccupation scales with low endorsement, we have several. Um, one is eroticized rage one, exploiting children and family. And we also have ER3, exploitive sex, abuse of trust, and ER4, sexual violence, intrusion, and hostility. In addition, we also have preoccupation with exhibition and public anonymous sex. And we have preoccupation with producing pornography.
So in summary, for a quick reference here, um, based on those criteria we looked at with, with the mean normative scores expressed as percentage of maximum possible, um, the scales with high endorsement, which, are, which means it's harder to get high scores, um, on the behavior scales, we have fantasy and consequences, pornography use, and relationship addiction. And for the preoccupation scales, we have preoccupation with relationships and preoccupation with isolated fantasizing. Okay, and then in summary for the scales with low endorsement, meaning they're easier to achieve high scores. For the behavior scales, swinging and group sex, cruising behavior, pain exchange, paying for sex power, exhibition, exploitive sex trust, exploitive sex child, and drug interaction. And then for the preoccupation scales, we have ER1, ER3, ER4, as well as preoccupation with exhibition and public anonymous sex, and pre preoccupation with producing pornography. Finally, for those interested, here are the references from the presentation.